Sorry about your luck there, buddy. Hey, there we go! <laughs> I know. I've been never. Oh, that's good. Yes, I play with them. I absolutely. Yes. I've been nibbling, okay? Uh -huh. <laughs> Alright, so what is that that you're putting? For particular applications where you needed accuracy. So, for example, hunting. You know, someone for whatever reason, reason was a sniper, etc. But smooth bore was what was used on the battlefield simply because of the load time. For a muzzle loading weapon, in order to use a rifle barrel, it means to load the weapon, you have to load the ball, which has to be the exact same size as the barrel, down through the rifling, and that takes time. Whereas on the battlefield, that's not a uh, luxury you have. Smooth bore weapons, you would usually use a ball slightly smaller than the barrel and drop it straight down so you could load it quickly. The problem was it wasn't accurate. So that was why they fought in line and block formations. The idea in military warfare of the period was is you had a line of soldiers who would send a wall of lead down the field and somebody would get hit. So, there, so therefore, you solved the load, the load time by using the smooth bore and you solved the quote unquote accuracy by having enough lead in the. In the in the air, so that the enemy is going to get hit. Are these flintlock? These two weapons that are behind me here are both matchlocks. My pistol over there is an early type of flintlock. Matchlock mechanism is in existence as early as the year 1415. We know that because there is a German document dated to that period, which clearly mentions one. In English military use, it will the matchlock will not entirely be withdrawn from the battlefield until 1710. Fire locks or flint locks are in use by 1580 to 1600 or so and will supplant and replace the match lock as the main battlefield weapon by the 18th century. So both of these weapons here are match locks. The pistol is an early fire lock of a type called a snap on Very interesting and informative. Whose beautiful pistol is that? Hey, uh, I heard somebody wanted you over in the Indian village. <laughs> did, did Beyond Buck make that? Who made it? You fired it yesterday. Oh, you did? Oh, that is beautiful. Uh, I wouldn't just go pick him up unless he was. Ten thousand dollars. How many years would you wait before you got some money back? Heck, how many weeks? 
right? Mm -hmm. Seven years, the Virginia Company of London has gotten their investors to invest. We're going to go to the new world, we're going to bring you gold, you're going to make a fortune, invest with us. That's in 1607. 1614, still no gold. There's no gold for Virginia. So what are they doing? Well, they're taking timber, they're taking walnuts, they're taking wood ash, they're taking sassafras. They're sending back anything they can get their hands on to make money. But it's not very effective. It's not until 1614 when tobacco becomes a really big, a growing concern. Get it? Growing concern? Sorry. When tobacco is recognized as, as it, and its value is recognized, it saves the economy because now they can make a profit. And they say, they, they, uh, they, grow this stuff everywhere, in the streets. Uh, the governor says for every two acres of tobacco you grow, you have to grow one of food because people aren't planting food anymore. It's that important. So that, and again, that happens here. But um, the first time you, you hear about tobacco, it's not here. Tobacco's been around for a while, but this particular strain is what's so important. Uh, and again, like I said, the first hospital, the first college, uh, private property. Uh, now we have uh, the Virginia Company of London running Jamestown, but if you live there, they own all that. The house you live in is owned by the Jamestown, by, by Virginia Company of London. Uh, if you live in Kikatan down in Newport News, it's the same thing. Here, when you come over as an indentured servant, after your seven-year contract is up, Thomas Dale gives you three acres of land. It's yours forever. Your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. And the Virginia Company of London likes that and makes it 50 acres. So now you can be a pig farmer in Sussex, England, come over here, work for someone for seven years, and get 50 acres of land. That's absolutely insane. And so, of course, there's your draw, right? And I don't know what, you, what the education department is going to say, but my, my take on why the English are successful here against the Indians is numbers. Yeah. We don't stop coming. We yeah. don't stop coming. Yeah. You, you got that golden carrot dangling in front of the yeah. eyes. Free land, free land. You're going to work for someone in England anyway. Yeah. Why not do it over here? And if we're not telling them over there that you might get an arrow through the throat or die of starvation, you know, the, 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 the small print in the ad is 50 free acres if you live. <laughs> and, uh, and the kicker is really, it gets even better because for every person I bring over later, if I have the money to bring my, over, my own servants over, I get even more land. I think it's an additional 50 acres. So I start off with 50 acres. Two years later, I've grown enough tobacco to bring over my own servants, and now I've got uh, two people. That's equal equals 100 acres. Now Rika Park, and I'm growing Orinoco tobacco, an old 1590s, 16th century Caribbean tobacco, which we think is very similar to what John put in the ground here, John Rawl. Of course, you can grow Burleys in the modern period from the 19th century on, brightly for cigarette tobacco, which starts about 1870. And there's all kinds of other tobaccos, European and other South American tobaccos. There are Guatemalan Orinocos. Uh, I've got a Frog Eye Orinoco, which is probably a Virginia tobacco, 18th century to put in next year. So you can grow all kinds of different tobaccos. It's a New World product from the start. You know, everybody in the New World knew about it, the Indians of all stripes. And they're the ones that introduced it to the Europeans. So tobacco is a pretty big culture, actually. It makes good money in the modern period. Last year, $80 million is what cigarette tobacco made in the field. Could have been 160 if it had been a really, really good crop. So there's some serious money in tobacco, even if you don't smoke. That's dog. And that's a hornworm. Hornworm tobacco or tomato. They're the same. Manduca yeah. sexta is what they're called in science. That's his head. That's his foot. So he's they come as little eggs, I pull them off, and then I put Bacillus thuringiae, as BT, under the leaves. And then I'll pick them up every week, sometimes twice a week.
Mm -hmm. Pink and white. Man, did she? She thought that. If you look at it closely, it will have that. Uh, you no, know, they have that um, upside down loop uh -huh. on the side. Of the well, see, we we were going this way 60 oh, yeah. miles an hour. Yeah. We just yeah. yeah. noticed the color and yeah. saw the the million <laughs> camera. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what that is. You know, that all is. Um, you yeah. have a big, big willow oak tree down there. I, I do. I've got the big walnuts and the big willows, yeah. Um, but I've been trying to get access to 360 right there. On the bike, it looks like they've been, they've been restricting me. Well, this is soft because it's... Um, and you're standing on 35 feet of wet clay. <laughs> so... We'll see how well that works. So have you, when you found other things, have mm -hmm. they been the same um, We depth? found things at all different depths. Okay. It can last for up to two weeks before you use it. So if it doesn't happen tomorrow, then it will happen the next day. Um, but I'm going to do it in here. You make what's called, well I'm using woad, so they call it a woad vat. Your dye vat. There's two different ways to do it, the, the chemical way that I'm going to do it, and there's a fermentation way as well, where you, in this case, a week or more, where you leave it in a warm place. You go and check it, and when you achieve the color you want, you take it out. Um, this one I'm using um, soda ash and spectrolyte chemicals. To, it's a mordant that sets the dye on the fabric. Because if you just dip it in the color, nothing's going to happen. It's, it won't stay. It'll fade away. Woad. What is that? It's a plant. Oh. Um, it's a plant that the Celts use to paint themselves blue, that dye. Oh. Um, that's woad. Um, and they use it for a long time as a, a clothing pigment, um, but then they found indigo and that works better. So this is the outdoor oven. It is. It's our bread oven.
about the same, maybe a little bit more for a, for a 65 foot or 88 foot boat with all modern equipment on it made of uh, high tech composite material and high tech sails out of it. Yeah, those laws. Yeah. Yeah. We go that, we can go that way. How can this move? <laughs> but they, uh, they clean their ear, that's an ear pick and a tooth pick. That last sand goes out, that was in 30 seconds. Watch them now, Zach. Chill, chill, chill. Hey, stop, right here. Get over there next year. Just tell you ready to get on. That means that if your shift all week goes from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. in the morning, you never see the sun, you never see the sunrise. After a couple of weeks, this will drive you really buggo, and your crew will get really mutinous, and you don't want this. Two hour shift will ship your time progressively back so that you get to see the sun. So, yeah, wait until you're on the watch without the dog watch for about three weeks. You'll have one group of people who've been in the midday sun for three weeks and have baked, been baked hard, and you'll have another group of people who've been seeing nothing but clouds and moonlight for their entire duration on board. This is just an interpretation of one of the artillery bastions. The city of Rikers had watchtowers, and they positioned this as one of the hypothetical bastions for artillery because it was at the sharp bend of the river. You had already went down to the Godspeed, you saw where it was docked. Well, the actual river, the James River, actually went around this way, not on its current course. That was later. So in 1611, the river actually went around and probably you parked in where the James River is now. So your car would be parked inside the James River or you crossed it. Remember your drive in, you saw the swamp on the left hand side? That swampy area was actually the, the James River, the port. <laughs> and there, sure, you missed another. We have uh, artillery demonstrations going on as well. But... Free, free heart attack. Huh? No, no charge. So they would have placed the artillery at, at, at that bend in the river so that it could engage ships because in the age of sail, as ships would come up, they'd have to tack and it would be so, such a sharp bend that they would lose, they would lose the, uh, the momentum and they'd even have to possibly tow it around the bend. And at that point, the ship would be most vulnerable. And that's where you would position your artillery. So if it was a Spanish ship, trying to find you and find it, raid out the English colony, you could actually fire upon it, be the most vulnerable. Foreign objects out of people, you know, pulled, like, let's say somebody got shot with an arrow, right? Grab this like a scissors. Grab it like a scissors. Now, poke in here, 
open wide. Okay, now grab it and now pull. And the guy's going ow, 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 because that, that thing hurts as bad coming out as it does going in. Shenandoah. Rob Roby is the one who restored Shenandoah. 